Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll do a little introduction, if that's okay. Um, I'm very delighted that Amy McCauley is speaking to our group this evening. I'm just going to give you a little background on Amy before she gets started. Amy McCauley was the preservation joiner at George Washington's Mount Vernon from 2019 until October 2022. She's recently been promoted to restoration manager for Mount Vernon. From 2002 until taking the position at Mount Vernon in 2019, Amy was owner of Oculus Fine Carpentry based in Portland, Oregon, where she specialised in the conservation and construction of 18th and 19th century windows and doors. Some notable projects of hers include George Washington's Mount Vernon, of mm -hmm. course, in Virginia, Hecata Head Lighthouse, which I hope I'm saying correctly, in Oregon, and Fort Simcoe in Washington State. Amy holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Oregon, and she's done post-baccalaureate work in architecture, historic archaeology, and English building history. In 2018, she was awarded a fellowship to Winterfur to study 18th century door construction methodology. And this evening, Amy is going to speak to us um, on the following topic. Necessity is the mother of invention. How the creation of sprung sash planes helped form a conservation joiner. So over to you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Coralie. And uh, thank you to the group for inviting me to uh, speak with you. It's a, it's a real honor. You all are very distinguished. And um, when I was putting my presentation together, I was a little, <laughs> I was a little flummoxed as to how best to tell uh, the story that I wanted to, to come across here. And um, I hope that you all enjoy it. And there'll be time at the end for questions and answers. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, um, Coralie. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So um, I'm going to start, and I was just telling uh, Vincent, actually, <laughs> when you come to a certain age uh, and look back on your career, uh, you kind of note uh, milestones where a, a decision one way or the other could have led you down a very different path. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a particular moment that greatly influenced um, the trajectory of my career. Um, in, let's see if this will work, come on. Uh, you cursed us, Coralie. Let me um, try to advance this. Come on. Mm. Hold on. My my screen won't advance. There we go. Okay. Um, in the spring of 2005, I met this gentleman. Um, this is David Rogers. He was a timber framer uh, out in Portland, Oregon, and we were working on this project together. This was my first uh, early settlement house. Early settlement in Oregon is between 1840s and 1860s which for you all probably isn't very old, but for Oregon, um, it is some of the oldest structures that we have. This is a founder's house built in 1856. And this was my first time working with grant money, the State Hisp Historic Preservation Office, a nonprofit group which owned the structure. And I had been um, contracted to restore the existing sash and to also provide some, some sash to 
replace some aluminum ones that had been placed in the house um, uh, in its lifetime. And so me being the you know contractor that I was, I went to my local window shop and got a bid for them to make windows. Um, and I brought this bid to a meeting where David was present and he said, well, uh, those, those windows should really be hand built because not only are you um, providing a product in keeping with the character of the house, but you're also keeping a dying craft alive. Now that little bit there at the end, keeping a dying craft alive, that really stuck with me. Um, and I looked at him befuddled and said, well, how do you make sash by hand? <laughs> the, the thought had not even entered my mind. And, and thinking now back, of course, you know, windows were at one point made by hand. So I went on a quest to accumulate tools, hand tools. And I went to my grandparents and I said, can I have all these tools? And I went to tool shows. I went to antique shops and I amassed tools and tools, not just planes, but quite a few tools. And so it was after I had accumulated some of these tools and, and really it was a trial and error to get to figure out how they worked. Uh, you know, I didn't have someone to show me how to saw with a handsaw. Um, <laughs> I did not have anyone show me how, you know, the correct way to, you know, sharpen a plain iron. Um, I learned a lot by just meeting people, older people, uh, reading, um, looking at old uh, trade manuals where it was a great uh, way to learn information. Just even starting from basics, how do you cut straight with a, with a handsaw? Um, and so at one point, uh, I... It became clear to me that um, there was a drive in me that really wanted to pursue this um, fully. And I made the decision to um, learn how to build these English style um, sash planes that have uh, their spring, their sprung, it's the spring angle. You run them at an angle, and I'll, I'll elaborate more on that in a second. Uh, and I did something absolutely crazy in 2009. So this is four years after I met David. I, After I'd made my first plane, I sold all my power tools. Uh, table saw, chop saw, routers, compressors, air guns, uh, every manner of power tool except for scale saw for cutting plywood, a hand, uh, power drill, because as, arch as we all know, architects love their fasteners, and um, a sawzall, because I ha sometimes I have to do removal of, of uh, you know, you know it's, a for, it's for demolition purposes, or removal of um, uh, elements. Uh, and so I embarked upon this journey, and you know, looking back at that now, it was, I, it was a crazy thing to do. I had young children. Um, <laughs> they were relying upon me to bring in this money. And now I was essentially going without power and competing in bids with companies that were fully electrified. So it was a um, unusual road to take. And I don't think I would be sitting in this chair if I had done that differently. Um, Coralie, this is the Scottish um, sash plane. Uh, they tend to have this longer fence right here. If you can see my cursor. Um, and really this, this spring uh, type of plane was popular in the UK and in America. You don't often see them in continental planes. Um, and so, and they're very simple. I needed simplicity because I didn't have power tools, so I couldn't 
you know, the, the American stick and rabbit plane was far too complicated to be building that. Um, and I needed something where if I had a profile I needed to match, I needed to be able to do it efficiently and quickly to build the plane uh, in order to do the repair or to make a, the, the sash from, from the ground up. And this is what, uh, when, you're, when you're running these planes, the spring is this angle that it runs at. And so this little flat area and that little flat area should be parallel to your bench um, to get the profile to be accurate. And when it bottoms out here, uh, this is like this is your fence right here. Uh, the profile stops cutting. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Vincent has probably used similar planes. Um, they're often used for sash, also for moldings of of various natures, that sort of thing. So, um, where to start uh, with blocks of American beach? Uh, I couldn't source out English beach. So we went uh, with the American beach. Uh, I cut out where the, the section, which is the wedge material actually, comes out of this part that I remove. Um, and really I used one of the sash, the old sash planes as a template. And I just matched it completely, figuring that, okay, this plane ran. So if I make one exactly like it, it will run too. Uh, there were some nuances to my process, but essentially that is uh, how I made my first planes. Now, uh, just a little segue here into how I document and um, research profiles. And I know we're all familiar with the profile gauge on the left. And when you're talking about sash profiles in particular, those profiles are quite small. And I've found that the needles on that profile gauge are far too large to accurately um, record the profile enough that I can make a plane from. So what I went to doing was using thin cardboard to make precisely the profile so that I can transfer that shape onto the body of the plane. Um, from the these cardboard profiles, I my my goal is to transfer them all to some thin metal to preserve them, um, as the cardboard does uh, wear over time, and then you get an inaccurate profile. And uh, I'm a little bit not so about accuracy with the profiles because <laughs> uh, it does reflect in the plain soul. Um, you you got to get that as accurate as possible. And I have found that working with hand tools, be as accurate as you possibly can because it's very easy to get off course and be inaccurate um, with it. After it's been blocked out, I form the sole of the plane. And you can see here where I've, I've drawn on the sole for that um, profile. I think this is the, the this is a sash profile. Um, I didn't start, you know, when I made my planes, they were just for my use. I needed them for certain projects. Uh, I did not sell them in any way. Um, they were more of a, you know, a necessity. Um, and while I was kind of accumulating my hand tools, the shop that I usually worked with um, got tired of me asking for four foot sections of bottom rail. <laughs> and so they would say, why don't you just make that yourself? <laughs> and eventually that's, you know, they, they, it was just too small of an order for them to set up the equipment to run a bottom rail for a sesh that I need, you know, a, a part of the sash that I need replaced, um, which also kind of influenced my necessity to be able to make these planes to any profile that I ran across um, in sash and door. So to, to, to form the sole, to make the, the bottom of the plane, you know, I use all manner of tools. I, I don't have a lot of, I, you know, I just didn't have a lot of, um, 
stuff. I don't have floats, they're too expensive. And so I just use kind of what I had on hand from very small uh, planes to, uh, you know, files of all nature, some gouges. Uh, so anything was up for, if, if it looked like it could work, I used it. Uh, here, you know, at once the once it's formed, you know, I go back to the profile just to make sure it's accurate, um, and then it's off to doing the mouth, which is actually technically the hardest part of this process. Um, I do use I do use a pilot hole, um, and then just a mortise chisel to kind of whittle that away. I make it sound uh, simpler than it is. <laughs> there was some trial and error. Um, for sure and you know you just learn from your mistakes for the iron the first plane that i made um i sent the iron off to a machine shop a very accurate drawing full scale and they were like no problem i go back and they had done it incorrectly and i and i said well you know these two points are not you know they're not parallel they're offset well, let me give it another go. And all they were doing was putting it on a little spindle sander and zapping it. And I went back and again, it was wrong. And after the third time, I said, just give it to me. And I had to modify it myself, essentially, uh, which took forever because it was already um, hardened and tempered. But it eventually got to where it needed to be. So I decided that, okay, I need to learn how to do this as well. Uh, I start with type O tools, type O one tool steel, uh, eighth inch thick, usually I think inch wide, depending upon the plane that I'm making. And you can see I could just cut it out with a hacksaw. I draw the profile. I actually put this into the mouth of the plane and wedge it and then just draw it on there. And then I hog it out with a hacksaw. And then at this point, I do most of the fine tuning with uh, small files. And then I put the bevel on. And as you can see, there's a small bit of material I leave there. Because if you take this down to a razor edge and then harden and temper, the firing will stress that edge and you'll get a, a kind of a jaggedy. Uh, uh, surface right there and it, and it's, it, it just scratches your material um, and it's, so it's, it's, it's better if you just leave a little bit of material and then after it's hardened and tempered you just take that off with sharpening and I use I'm old school so I use oil stones and some diamond stones I have a diamond cone that works really well for molding plain irons um, I think DMT makes that thing so I don't have a forge so it's very DIY with this so I use a map gas torch and some fire bricks um, and to do the tempering I quench it in uh, in oil and not water um, and that's now this is after talking with several people uh, uh, that I've met in the UK that do a lot more um, hardening tempering than I do and they kind of guided me through this this process when I was first starting out. It works uh, if you have a forge or kiln it definitely you can really fine-tune you know that hardness um, and really dial it in. It worked and I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth with that. <laughs> um, uh, I can certainly uh, be more scientific with that, but um, you know, they did it way back then, so it seems to work for me doing it this way. And as you can see, the uh, the safety glasses on the hat are real. Uh, it's a real good use for those. The last thing that I usually build on the plane is a wedge. And this is where uh, I give a little leeway for my own uh, design or style in that I'll ease this section um, a bit 
just as my that's kind of my own my own thing. Oops. And then this is the final product. Now, since I've been doing this, I've come to, you know, they've evolved over time. Um, I've taken on some characteristics that are more 18th century than say 19th century. Uh, I have a, a more of a circular finial instead of an oval. My chamfers are fairly wide. Uh, the body is very squat and low. My shoulders are steep. Um, and so there's some qualities of the 18th century planes that I really love. They're just beautiful to look at. Um, they're beautifully done. And I've tried to incorporate some of those into my, into my planes. Um, and so really the plane is not the end product. The accurate molding is the end product of all of this endeavor. Um, so what did I use them for? Um, this sash was eaten by squirrels. And I built a plane of the profile and, so that I could run sticking to make my repairs in there. Um, and it, the, it's great because you can run as little or as much as you need. Uh, I don't have to wait for a machine shop to you know, make it for me. Um, I, can I don't have to do the full uh, sash bar. I can just do a small section. It's, it makes it so that my repairs can be pretty versatile depending upon the situation. Uh, here's a repair I did here uh, at Mount Vernon, and I built the plane to uh, run this molding. And it, uh, I find it to be, um, you know, it's, it's great that I've learned this skill um, and it's definitely helped me uh, do some, some good repair work. I've also run new moldings. This is for a lighthouse um, out on in uh, Washington State. And so I, for this particular project, the, the molding was missing. And so I built a very complicated plane to, to run this. And the, and everything that I, you know, the molding is done by hand, the aprons, the, the storm windows, the stops, everything. Because I just don't have the power tools, uh, it's all done by hand. Uh, just by the, the fact that, you know, that's what I do. And it's led me down a very um, unique path. I've worked on gold dredges. Uh, this is Fort Simcoe in Washington State. This is a frontier era uh, military fort uh, built in the 1850s. Lighthouses, I've worked on seven lighthouses, mostly on the uh, Pacific Coast, Oregon and Washington State. This is um, the one that was mentioned by Coralie. This is Hasita Head. And of course, here I am at George Washington's house. Um, so it's been a very curious road uh, that I've that I've taken. Uh, I wouldn't have changed any of it. Um, it's been an amazing journey. Um, and this this last picture, this is uh, the plane that made those that molding that you saw in the lighthouse. It's it was a lesson in um, tenacity to build this and to run that material. Uh, and that uh, might be a story for another day. It's uh, it's called the peacock that that plane. Um, it almost didn't it almost didn't work, but uh, it did in the end. So uh, if you guys have questions, or um, I can try and speak to any part of that that uh, you know you find it interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Amy. That's absolutely <laughs> wonderful insight into your world. 
Um, I'm going to ask folks if they could raise their digital hand if they would like to ask you a question. Um, they can do that in the reactions uh, tab at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Um, so let's see if we have any questions from the floor. Oh, we do. I think Joe yeah. just got in there first. So <laughs> Joe Thompson. <laughs> Hi, hi, Amy. Got that? That's, hey, Jeff. Uh, that was amazing. So resourceful. Um, quite incredible. Um, so many thoughts have come to mind from that, but I, I, one of them is related. I thought it was a Nicomos one. So have you come across the um, there was a conference in Bath in the, in the 1990s that Nicomos ran? I, is it up on the um, the the the. Uh the word committee website is it been published i don't know I, i'll have to have a look but th that okay. covered it because you there was a specific paper on scottish planes and you okay. mentioned and, and a few because they've got some slightly different planes to that, that we get down in in the south because of the mm -hmm. differences in the weather um but just you know i mean o over here you know we we're, we're so we take a lot of things for granted but you know we don't have to make our own planes you know that's really yeah. <laughs> The, what I found was, you know, there was the thought, well, well, I can just go out and find that profile. But, uh, you know, there wasn't, to tell you the truth, I couldn't find a lot of sash planes just out in the wild. Um, yeah. I had like one or two that I found, and those were kind of my templates for building them. And so just, you know, I just didn't have the, and, and you guys are so lucky over there. You've got planes like grown out of your ears yeah uh, and, and for for really inexpensive uh you know those older planes and so i just didn't have the the, the quantity to to go out and try and find certain profiles and i really didn't want to like get a plane and then have to modify it because i thought you know there's there's history in those planes mm. um if if any of you have ever picked one up, especially an older one, you can see the rub marks from the hands that have used those for years. I have planes that, you know, are worn, like the, the wood is worn away from the hands that hold them. And I felt like it was a desecration to actually modify anything like that. So I just, you know, I'll make my own. <laughs> oh, it fantastic. Seems and you've, I'm sure you've also heard of the uh, Tafts, the Tall and Trade Systems. Oh, yes. Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've met Jan, and I was actually consulting um, the British, the Goodman British. Oh, book, brilliant. Uh, yeah. This morning when I was like trying to prep for this thing. <laughs> oh, well, you're in good hands there then. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Uh, Vincent has a question for you. Oh, I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. Um, absolutely blown away this is so inspiring amy it's just incredible and i absolutely love it i can't cannot tell you um thank you Vincent. it's absolutely just fantastic so now i've got i've got so many questions i won't i won't i won't I, i'm probably going to call you at another another time to to answer all these to get these questions answered but my one of my my first questions is when I'm interested about the um, the profitability regarding the, you know you're making these by hand. Mm -hmm. um, if you've only got a small section, like let's say you've got a glazing bar with a particular profile that is quite unusual, and you're not going to use that profile again, you've got to make a plane for maybe two two or three meters of glazing bar. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you factor that into your your sort of budgeting H how does it work you know how, when, when do you think right this is not worth making you know on a commercial level so i would say okay, there's i have a couple um of the thoughts now this these um this is not for everybody um i I'll, I'll say up front that I live and breathe this work. Um, and, I've, and I've told this and I'll tell it to you publicly that if I win the lottery tomorrow, I'm still gonna come to work and do this work. <laughs> and to ask me not to is to kind of ask me not to, not to 
breathe. Um, it's so, you know, I was put on this earth to do this work. Uh, and so when I'm thinking about the planes, I never charged those planes to a project because uh. then they would have ownership of that plane and I would feel obligated to give it to them. And I wanted that those planes to be in my collection so that I can use them. You know, I, I never knew if I would run across that profile again. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to keep them in case I needed them again, because I didn't want to reinvent the wheel with a, a profile. Uh, the planes take, now I've got it down to where I can build them in eight hours. Right. Uh, eight hours of working time. Uh, they're a joy to make. Uh, and so when I went out to bid, say, for the lighthouse, and I knew that um, I wanted to attempt to make that trim by hand, you know, I mentally calculated, like, okay, I'm going to need this amount of t time my own time to build the plane and that plane in particular was a bit of a wild card because it's not it has no it's not a spring plane it is run up and down and it's based on a plane that i saw in a david russell book it's very wide it's unlike any plane i've ever built um before or since mm -hmm. Uh, and I and the, it was the challenge of it actually that drove me to do it. Um, you know, in when I was in the middle of uh, running two hundred lineal feet of it, you know, I was. There were moments when I questioned my sanity, like, is this going to work? Because it was unlike anything I'd done before. It's not like running sash bar. Um, it was very complicated and I had re I relied upon a joiner in England to help me figure out how the heck to run it because really the plane was the very last sweep because I had to have seven planes working before that on that material to get it even close to the profile before I ran that final pass with the um, with that big wide big wide plane yeah. So, you know, it's just, uh, for me personally, it's a labor of love. Um, and, you know, it, when going into a project, you know, when, when I went to the pre-bid meeting and, you know, figured out, okay, I'm going to need to build a plane, then, you know, I've, I've calculated for that time my, on my own time. And it, and it must be, it must be frustrating if you come across a particular profile that's, literally about a 16th 16th out or an eighth out or something is exactly the same apart from that one section <laughs> and you you yeah. can't modify your plane <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know there are moments like that um and you know you you just gotta roll with it and um, you yeah. know do the right thing essentially and, and build it I think I just God. I think it's inc I, I love it. I love and and the fact your point about saying that stuck in your mind about um, keeping a craft alive. You know that. You know that's just that just really struck a chord with me because I'm I'm as you as you know I'm involved in in trying to highlight this, the the shortage of specialist trades mm -hmm. and um, you know who can make sash windows by hand. You know, uh, uh, well, I, I look to the UK. Yeah, you all make it by hand, don't you? Not with all these more. No, no, no. Uh, Joe, do you know anybody that can make it from scratch? Yeah, well, there's um, there's, there's uh, Jed Gardner. Do you know Jed? I mean, no, no. Just just retired and uh, Richard Arnold. Yes, Is Richard it? Arnold. He's the yeah. one that saved my ass uh. on that lighthouse. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, it, it, that, the, these are rare breeds. You know these. Um, Jed's got an amazing collection of um, some of the uh, sash pocket chisels and the doweling boxes and all the other sort of little tricks of the trade. Has and, he? Um, yeah, 
he, he describes the sash window makers as almost like the uh, laboratory technicians, you know, wearing lab coats. <laughs> the, the precision and the sort of the, the the cleanliness of the workshop and the whole approach is this isn't like normal joinery. You know, you, you're entering rarefied air here. You know, it's a it's a different world. Oh, I um, love it. God, I, and, thank, thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just very happy. Really good. <laughs> And I'll just add that, I mean, the difficulty that you have, Amy, is that you don't have the planes. We have lots of planes, but what we don't really have is great timber. But I'm imagining mm. with your, you've got the British Columbian pine there, that you've got some really nice slow yes. grown. Yes, and uh, one of the, the picture that showed the, um, the profile that was yeah. done, that there on the left, that's Alaska yellow cedar, and there's nothing like that. Yeah. Plain in that stuff and really here on the east uh i have access to old growth poplar which is beautiful um the southern yellow pine holds an edge beautifully but it is so hard on mm. my, my hands um, yeah so uh yeah it's uh -huh. but what do you what kinds of species do you have over there that you're working with it's all Pinus sylvestris, um, okay. but European redwood, but it, it's difficult. To, the, I mean, look at the, the ring count on that at the left hand slide there is, um, you know, it's very difficult to get that sort of very slow growing stuff, which we used to have in, in, in enormous quantity. Mm. And you get the resinous smell when you work it. But yeah. the, the, the plantation material that we get is, is, um, is, is very rarely like that. That's why you need to repair all those ash. Well, this this is it. I yeah. mean, the campaign's been running for for thirty odd years now, um, but we've got a long way to go, haven't we, Vincent? Yeah. Yeah, it must be difficult to you know because when I'm doing a repair like that, uh, I try and match. Uh, there's quite a few characteristics I, that I try to match um, the old material to the piece I'm um, putting in. Um, and you know species and um, uh, you know ring counts you know mm -hmm. those sorts of things come into play but if you don't have the timber how do you do you guys you know try and match species as best you can or is that even possible well I mean uh, it, for, for me it, it it's it's trying to find something that's that's, that's I, I put quality over species for me mm -hmm. um, because uh, as Joe said we what they sell as redwood over here, it's dreadful. If you go to the, the local timber merchant and, and, and ask for redwood, it's just, it's just rubbish. So I would prefer to use something like a Douglas fir or something like that over a redwood because you, you get the better quality, even, even if you're, so I'm restoring some windows at the moment and it's, it's Pinus sylvestris at 1820, so fantastically slow grown pine. But um, I'm doing the repairs in some Douglas fir because I can't get the decent pine. So, do yeah. you have issues with the difference in expansion and contraction with those species? Um, I mean, I just uh, I think it's minimal. I, I, I think as long as you're getting your your moisture content, uh, you know, pretty accurate. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's minimal. But it's what choice do you have? Either yeah, if you, inferior if... wood or you know it's, it's, it's difficult yeah yeah that's a hard choice to make and i've been blessed with uh having some excellent wood to choose from especially here at this yeah. state um so yeah, that would be a challenge absolutely yeah well amy i have a question for you yeah. if that's okay uh -huh. um in a in a, a large building like mount vernon how many different profiles are you dealing with and you know ha just how many different planes do you need for doing the sort of running repair work mm -hmm. on a building like that are we talking just a handful or is it are there many it, many different? it is a handful it's yeah. not very many um there were several building campaigns here that uh, george washington undertook and he did um as fashion was at the time narrowed the profile uh, between uh, the 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 kind of the the central core of the house, when he expanded out to the north and the south, he diminished the sash bar width 
and that profile is different than the older, wider uh, ovalo that we have in the central core of the house. So there's a few variations, and then, but I also, um, that beading plane, let's see if I can bring it up here. Uh, the beading plane that I have in this picture uh, is just for our siding board. So I've done some right there. See that? Yeah. Um, right there. That was that was a very particular profile that we needed because it's all it's on all the siding of the outbuildings and um, on the doors, the the board and bat doors that we that we make this half inch bead is okay. there, and I couldn't find a half inch plane in the wild that would meet the the criteria for for this place. Um, that bead was like an all day discussion where I went through the whole house and like category, you know, I, I recorded all the half inch beads and made meticulous little templates of those. And we finally settled on the correct, you know, quirk and bead that uh, they would like. And then I made the plane to match it because it took a, it took a bit. Um, so there are places other than Sash that where I, I build the planes. We have we have um, paneling in two of the rooms where I did some. I, I made a plane for the panel mold. There's doors that have various um, profiles. So, you know, it keeps me busy. That is just amazing. You have such a intimate connection with the fabric of that building. That's just amazing. And I believe yeah. Mat Matthias has a question for okay. you. Matthias? Yeah, Amy, very yeah. interesting to see this. And uh, I will just ask you, have you seen the collection of planes at Skokloster Castle in Sweden? I have seen photos and I'm trying to get to Sweden. Yeah. Um, I have seen photos of that. Um, I don't know too much about that collection, but if, if I ever get, or when I get to Sweden, I'm going to definitely look that up. I, I was the, the restoration, leading the restoration of the roof construction in eight years at School Cluster. And so I've been, uh, many times looking at these pieces, masterpieces from uh, from the Dutch carpenters in 1650. So they are very, very nice. Yes. It would be amazing to look at that. Because um, I haven't, we don't have anything that old. Um, so it would be uh, an education to see that. No. Absolutely. Thank you both. Vincent, would you like to ask another question? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm right. sure you would. <laughs> yeah. So, so you've got your, 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 you cut your profile out uh, in this picture we're looking at here. Yeah. And then you've got to sharpen your blade. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how are you accurately keeping that profile when you sharpen your, your blade? So... It, when you look at an eye, let's see if I can back up here to the iron part. The irons have a flat, a flat face, and then the, the the side with the bevel. We call the flat section the face, and the beveled side we call the back. Which is it's a little strange, but so I will sharpen the flat face with my oil stones and my diamond stones. Now what this will do, now this is after, this is after I've gotten rid of this material here because yeah. to get rid of this, you're gonna have to work on that bevel side. And that's where I use um, a variety of uh, like cones. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, they're, I, don't, I don't know that. They're, they're tapered diamond stones oh, like in a yeah. cone shape. Or you can use slips of 
various, you know, profiles, um, depending upon how complicated your, your iron is. So, you know, let's just say, you know, I've picked up the plane and I need to sharpen it before I run material. I will sharpen the, the face until it raises the burr ah, and feel it on the other side oh that's what you're doing yeah flattening it and then i'll go back cut you know with a very fine slip to remove the burr Got you. and that's all i do right how, how do you think that do you know how they did it in the 18th century and 19th century what what tools were they using for were they just using for, files and slip stones do you think for making the the bevel or for yeah, uh yeah uh, so for uh well for both i suppose making how do they make that bevel to start with uh, they would have used files yeah I think they used, they used had files. Used files. and then then slip stones and then a, then a regular oil stone to flatten it flatten. yes correct uh, um and those irons are blacksmith made so they're you know the the they behave a little differently than this because this is modern steel. Um, but the principle is the same for okay. sharpening. So so, um, so when you start to lose that profile is when you go over the edge of your burr, if you, if you go over the top, then right. you start to alter that profile. You do. And if you're not careful and you're just being aggressive about it, you can, you can yeah. lose it. That, but that being said, it is hardened and tempered, so it does take a bit of work to modify that edge. Ah, uh, yeah. It's not the, when it's like this in this picture; it's very soft because I haven't hardened or tempered it. And then it must be so difficult to get to get it ex precisely to your 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 mold, you know, to, to grind it to that profile. It must be really. It must take. It, it takes a minute yeah you know i've set you know i can build them in eight hours and so if it goes longer i need to figure out is is there what, what's going what's going wrong here um is the profile complicated uh it's is the metal is there something wrong with the metal it's you know what what's maybe i'm just getting old and i'm slowing down but um you know for simple profiles like this it's not it's not too hard i haven't found it to be difficult and there, there would have been specific tool do you think there would have been specific tool makers or do you think the carpenters and joiners in the 17th and 18th century would have been making their own tools as well well that's an interesting thing because i've read text where as an apprentice you're going to build your bench planes that's one of the things that you Is do it? as an apprentice uh, so there is, uh, you know, when you're first starting, I think when you're first starting out, you're building those bench planes and bench planes are fairly simple to make. Um, and I, I want to say, I was looking in Jane's book this morning, the, the, uh, Purcell is the first commercial UK plane maker that's our purview. What's his name? Joe, yeah, do you I know? Purview. Purview. I think it's purview. Yeah. yeah. Perfume. You know, and he's in the same kind of uh, time frame as Robert Wooding. You know, mm. these are dedicated plane makers. At some point, you know, dedicated plane makers started to become prolific in the UK. Um, you I'll, know, I'll just add in the, the this this one of the debates amongst plane collectors is that sometimes there are two identical planes with a number one and a number two on. <laughs> I knew <laughs> someone was going to ask that. And one of the theories is that the number one plane is, is sort of what Vincent's touching upon. That does all the roughing out and it maybe gets sharpened a little bit inaccurately. Then the number two, which is the sort of the master one, just does the finishing one or two strokes and sort of regularizes, brings everything back into um, order, so to Have speak. You That's read one Richard of the theories. Arnold's article. Does he dispute that one? Well, he did a little experiment. Yeah. And when you're running sash bar on particular profiles, uh, you know, when you, if you, if you think about the bar, you're, you're making your first profile on one side. Yeah. And then when you flip it over, you've lost a little bit of that material that the plane rides on. And he found that that first 
the first profile is done with the number one. The number two, the, the, the little fence, let me see if I can bring it up here. What is that? This little area right here, that length, he said was mm. a tiny bit shorter. And so that it, he was able to do the second pass with, with that material missing and still get an accurate profile. Mm. That being said, I think it's a, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's kind of like the nib with mm. hand saws yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's a little controversial. There's a lot of theory um, and I really don't know. I have a lot of pairs and I've, you know, you always picture yourself, you know, doing research at all hours of the day, diving mm. into these things. Um, and I just haven't got around to it. Um, looking at my pairs so you know there's there's theories out there about the pairs well that's it there's more more to discover that's yeah. great i hope the the questions tonight sorry not at all great questions and and great answers too and thank you very much vincent for hosting and thank not you not so much thank not you so much for everyone for showing up and to amy especially what a fascinating insight into your work thank you so much amy oh, um, it was a pleasure <laughs> and we'll we'll uh, get some information out about our next talks soon uh, we haven't got a, a date for a next one yet but that will be coming soon and in the meantime thank you all and thank you especially amy bye, bye for now. Now. thank bye. you bye, -bye. bye. bye.